Johnny comes marching home again. Hurrah, hurrah. We'll give him a hearty welcome then. Hurrah, hurrah. The men will cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies they will all turn out. And we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. Hi, I'm Pam Stegner. This is KCXL, Radio Free Liberty. We're normally here every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 4 to 5 p.m. My show today is a pre-recorded show, and my guest is A.G. Hawk. He has just written a book that's uh, published by Paladin Press, and we're going to be talking with him. I'll let you know about the book he's written, but we're going to be talking with about weapons of mass destruction. By the way, my sponsor is Joe Titoni of the Supernatural Health Food Center. He has great vitamins. I talk about his vitamins all the time, and I take his vitamins. His Supervite is a wonderful vitamin. I, he doesn't like to make these claims, but I can tell you that when I take his multivitamin, I do not get bug bites, I don't get the chiggers, I don't get mosquitoes, I don't get ticks, and all of you know that I go and climb around in the woods and crawl through the grass and everything else, and I was with a, we went on a women's gun shoot uh, a while back, and all the other ladies had on long sleeves, and they had their sleeves duct taped to their wrist and their pants duct taped to their boots around their ankles and I was out there running around in my boots and my shorts and I didn't get one bite and everybody else had like 50 chigger bites from their ankles to their knees and I didn't have anything and I contributed to taking Supervite and I did a little test I quit taking the Supervite and I got bug bites and then when I started taking it again I didn't get it so you know if you're if you're a larger man you might want to take I take two a day you probably want to take four a day if you're a larger man and you're trying not to get these bug bites we have ticks terribly this year in Missouri so if you're going outside and hunting and doing those kinds of things you might want to get a really good vitamin like Supervite you can get a two and one half month supply for only eighteen dollars and ninety eight cents now Supervite has hundred and sixteen nutrients it's doctor recommended it's great for everyday stress a comparable product is going to cost you about forty bucks but not Supervite, and you can get it at the Natural Food Center in Grandview, and they also have the buy one, get one free specials. And remember to mention my name, Pam Stegner, and they will give you a free sample. Write this number down and call today for Supervite, 816-765-1135. That's 816-765-1135. If you're out of the Kansas City area, call 1-800-POWER-21. That's 1-800-P-O-W-E-R. 21 and by the way Joe does mail order and he doesn't care if you're in the Kansas City area or where you're at if you can't get down there to Grandview he'll be happy to mail out to you you can hear all of our shows on the internet at www.kcxl.com all of our shows are broadcast live there now so you might want to check us out hi AG do you want me to call you AG or Hawk or how do you want me to address you oh, we, Pam, AG is just fine okay we're getting a little feedback Richard can you kind of adjust this we're can you hear me now? Are we okay? Well, I can hear you. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on my show. I really appreciate it. I think this show is probably going to air sometime in October, and re we're re pre-recording it. But you really do some neat stuff, and you travel around the world. A.G. is a Special Forces Officer Veteran. He has a B.S. in a Biology and a Master's in Psychology uh, counseling and he works with people on weapons of mass destruction. He actually uh, specializes in family counseling, counseling for weapons of mass destruction. And when he first told me that, I went kind of went, well, that's really new and different. But I guess there's really becoming a need for that, isn't there, A.G.? Well, absolutely, Pam. Uh, essentially, the whole weapons of mass destruction concept is not necessarily new. It's just become new in that it seems to be more applicable to civilian society these days than during, say, perhaps the Cold War era when it was more of a military-type concept. And so the whole need for counseling people in how to deal with the aftermath of weapons of mass destruction has become more of, of an important issue simply because in the recent years the powers that be have done some assessments and with the changing climate in uh, 
the global political situation, there seems to be a lot more concern about weapons of mass destruction being used uh, maliciously against, for the most part, innocent civilian targets or by terrorists. And when I was talking to you yesterday, you made the comment, it's not a matter of if, but when, right? Well, that's exactly right. Um, basically, before we get started, I'd like to, to make two things very clear. Um, one is that everything that we're going to discuss today is all information that is available, uh, open source, non-classified, and I confirmed all these things myself before we had this interview today. Excellent. And secondly, that um, I, I don't want to alarm anyone. My main objective in conducting this interview with you today is simply to make people aware, get them curious, and hopefully from their own interest, they'll do their own research, find the information, um, make their own decisions, and choose their own courses of action from that. Yeah, and that's really what we're about. It, knowledge is power, and it, we're not here to make people frightened, but to take action. And I know one of the things, when I started understanding nuclear, biological, chemical, you know, I just kind of wanted to throw up my hands and go, oh, no, what can I do about that? Well, there's a lot of things we can do about it. And one of the things that I did, A.G., was I took NBC classes and self-protection, and I had to take more than one class, and I'm lucky enough to have a nephew who uh, specializes in NBC. He teaches those classes. But I was one of these people who gets claustrophobia when I put on a gas mask. And, but I've learned to overcome that, and I even have worked with my children, and I now feel comfortable enough that I'm certain that I could survive an NBC situation or one of these weapons of mass destruction. And, well, that's, and, and that's very good, and that's exactly what it's all about. Um, there's really nothing out there that's so formidable that we can't overcome it if we simply apply ourselves and, and get some training. The, the main reason we fear is through ignorance, and the way to overcome that is by doing just as you've done and, and get some training and get some knowledge, information. Um, but to go back to the original point, the, the whole concept of why I chose to do my master's program in counseling people in this particular thing is just as you say, um, if you start to go out and look the information up on the internet, you'll find that there's a one, one very profound quote by the Secretary of Defense that says that he foresees the proliferation of the weapons of mass destruction as the most significant and serious challenge that our society has ever faced. Wow. And based on a quote like that of, of such magnitude from a position, a person in such a position, uh, it doesn't take a lot to realize that they're, they're very concerned at the highest levels about weapons of mass destruction. And the, the reason it becomes even more important is twofold. One, with the fall of the wall in the Soviet Union, there was obviously a uh, deterioration of the financial infrastructure from which all the military people in charge of nuclear arms um, derived their pay so they could feed their families. When all of this went away, everything that they knew and understand went away, they were very tempted by people with money to perhaps lose sight of a couple of nuclear arms here and there. And so we have documented cases you can read about in, in most newspapers, if you do a good uh, search on the web, about loss of control of nuclear arms. Now, we are concerned about that loss of control because that means that there's someone out there that obviously had a reason to want to purchase these, and, and, and we have obviously many international, for lack of a better word, enemies that would, would love to get their hands on something like that and then use it against our people. And so the big concern that we have right now, uh, that is Uncle Sam, is how can we track these weapons down? How can we gather them back up? How can we control them? And most importantly, how can we prevent them from getting into our country and being used against our own people on our soil? And that's a major concern. As everyone knows, we're, we're a free country, and it's, it's exactly that that openness that we have in our society that makes us so susceptible to a terrorist attack. And so the weapons of mass destruction has become such a priority in the recent years um, as far as uh, the government's, the United States government's concerned that they've actually started to spend billions of dollars training wow. and creating and establishing entities that are specifically designed to respond and react to a weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, biological, chemical 
incident on U.S. soil. And basically the three major entities, um, the FBI, the CIA, and the State Department, have all come up with the same assessments through their own channels that it is no longer a matter of if, but a question of when we will see such an incident in our country. And most of them project it probably within the next decade. Wow. And this is directly related to the Soviet Union not being the Soviet Union anymore, but changing over to Russia. Absolutely. And th this is where, like, the military officers and all these people that were involved with these weapons, uh, it, it all changed for them, right? Oh, absolutely. What a lot of people don't realize that, that haven't uh, been exposed to the Russian system is that it was kind of a blend of the worst of communist and capitalist ideologies. <laughs> and, and I say that to say this, that when the wall fell, the men that were in charge of whatever it be, their respective uh, submarine base, uh, aviation base, nuclear base, they essentially became the new proud owners of whatever materials were, were on their base that, of which they were in charge. Oh, my gosh, that's scary. By virtue of the fact that there was no, no control. That is scary. That's like the biggest bully on the block wins. Well, there you go. And now you take this general who's in charge of, say, 100, you know, uh, small nuclear weapons, and he, he, here he has his soldiers that he can't, he can't pay, they can't feed their families, his Ooh. own family's hungry. And then he has, let's say, for example, some very wealthy um, Chinese or Arab businessmen that are offering him quite a pretty penny to simply lose a couple things off his hand receipt. I bet that happened a bunch. We were also mentioning yesterday about these 50 nukes uh, briefcase bombs that came up missing. Oh, absolutely. So and, this is how they know, came up everything, missing. Everything, Pam, w when you go and you do your search, you'll find a story that says one thing and then a story that conflicts with that. And as as with anything in politics, that's simply the way of it. So when you when you go out there and they do their, their Internet research, they'll find that there are a number of cases uh, or reports of missing nukes, and there will always be those people that are in positions of power that say, no, that's not possible, never happened. And people simply need to understand that that's their job. You know, they're going to have to take it with a grain of salt and make their own assessment. But you're absolutely right. There's uh, a number of reports from very reputable people that in the former Soviet Union that state that they had a number of backpack or, as they call, briefcase nukes that they lost control of, and, and the number is estimated about 50. Wow. And now, what people need to, to be aware of is that those particular uh, weapons, they're not necessarily nuclear, they're more atomic. They're a lower-grade explosion, but they're significant nonetheless. And Very. the reason that I'm familiar with it is because during the Cold War era, and this is no longer classified, but Special Forces guys were trained in how to put these together uh, so that they can either jump in, scuba in, or even walk across a border and place a small uh, atomic demolition munition. That's what they call them, SATOMs. And, um, and if we had it, then you can rest assured that certainly the Soviet Spetsnaz had the same thing. They got it. Now, how, have they put this on our soil? Well, have, that's is this where confirmed? it gets real interesting. Um, it's a proven fact. Um, we had a defector come in, and he actually he told our people that, yes, we have placed caches of weapons and money all over your country, the same as we've done. And, you know, it was hard for people to believe, but he was actually able to bring the debriefers to a location and show them a cache site. Oh, okay, my And gosh. this was in Brainerd, Minnesota. Whoa. And what people don't realize, if you take and pull out your map, when you look at Brainerd, Minnesota, you'll see that it's very close to the Canadian border, and there's an area or region up there they call the Boundary Waters. Now, this is primarily woodland and um, waterways, very, very easily penetratable by Special Forces Spetsnaz types. So they could have easily infiltrated into Canada and then just come over at night in canoes or scuba and just place these munitions right there so that the way the system works in the big picture is when what they have when they have what they call sleeper agents who actually have infiltrated and live in the city. Um, they work at what they call the invisible jobs. They do like, you know, a barber or a janitor or a waiter, the kind of jobs where people are comfortable talking around them because they don't, those people don't count, so they just speak freely. Uh -huh. and they gather information, and these people are what they call sleeper agents, and they'll sit there for years at a time and just wait until they get their little message that tells them to be activated, then they'll go and recover from a cache site 
uh, message, and it will tell them, go pick up the bomb, and this is where we want you to place it. Or pick it up wow. and deliver it to another place where yet another agent will pick it up and, and place it on the target. It might be a janitor inside of a power plant. Uh-huh. See what I'm saying? So that's kind of the way it works. And when, when this guy showed them this cache of weapons and money in Brainerd, Minnesota, he explained to them that he was aware of at least 250 other such caches around the U.S. Wow. 250. Now, that's one man, and as you know, in the intelligence community, most things are compartmentalized so that not everyone knows everything. Yeah. Now, um, the, the type of weapons uh, that might be hidden, that remains to be seen. He did not say that he knew of you know, small atomic weapons being cached, so I don't want to mislead anyone. Uh, that's something you'll have to connect the dots yourself. However, what's important to note is for any would-be treasure seekers, all these cache sites are booby-trapped. So, you know, if anyone's interested in going out trying to point, these, please be careful. Yeah, good point. Okay. But you the know, bottom line is, yes, America has been penetrated. We have Russian weapons cached on American soil. There has been a documented loss of small nuclear weapons. And the nuclear weapons are not, to me, so much the concern as are the chemical and biological weapons, of which we have far less uh, accountability and control. So in these caches that has been that you're aware of at this point, have they have they contained any chemical biological agents? No, I don't think that they have and and probably a major reason for that is simply because to my knowledge a lot of these things have um very uh precarious lifespans, they don't last very long. Uh -huh. And some folks would even uh would you say discourage the concern about the atomic weapons because they say those also have a, a limited lifespan as well and it's not my area of expertise the atomic munitions but i have had some friends say yeah they do have a, a short lifespan of a couple hundred years that's pretty long really yeah it, it's it's enough for me to be concerned well how easy is this stuff to make could they make it right here um, they wanted now to? making is another thing that that's certainly supersedes my area of expertise, so I, I wouldn't begin to tell you about things that I don't know. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I do have a lot of friends, obviously, from the Special Forces community that are demolitions experts, and most of them will say that it, it takes it takes a little doing to make anything of an atomic-grade uh, weapon. So most of the time, I think the biggest concern for us would be the, the government, the former Soviet Union, their creation of weapons and the loss of control of those actual weapons. Well, what about a biological, a chemical? Could would it be easily more easily made than a nuclear? Um, you know, in fact, those types of things are possible, and um, they, while challenging, they're not impossible to be made at a low level by, say, a small group that had uh, enough uh, income and uh, interest um, and knowledge to to put these things together. Um, simple things like an anthrax virus would not be too terribly difficult to create. Um, certainly a very malicious uh, disease process that they could spread around. While treatable, uh, its onset and action is so rapid that it would most likely be fatal for most folks should uh, something like that be spread about. Wow. You know, what you are sharing with me, it, it, these, are the, these are the kinds of things that strikes fear into people's heart. And I, I've shared with my listeners, as I've shared with you, is that I'm an EMT paramedic intern. And the Kansas City area has been actually a pilot test site for um, hazmat response. And, you know, when I look at the fire departments and how unprepared they are, I am astounded. Well... Just to, uh, just to cover that point um, very briefly, um, people need to realize that uh, there is a big difference between the civilian and military sectors and how they approach training and therefore their, their ultimate uh, level of preparedness. Now, the civilians in general do tend to do quite well in the respect that they deal with a continually varied uh, environment. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, every time a fireman or a paramedic or a cop walks into a scenario, it's different. Yeah. And they right. do much better at that than the military folks who tend to, to train in the same scenario over and over and over. However, um, the military does tend to be much better in, in being uh, somewhat machine-like in their approach and their methodology and their, their product. Um, however, the interesting thing about this whole weapons of mass destruction is that um, 
I think most people, most of your listeners, are, are fully aware of how the National Guard and Reserve work together with the military. Um, in the big picture, that is, you know, the U.S. military works a broad active duty. Uh, the Reserve primarily supplements overseas work, and the National Guard is the militia that can either work and support the guys overseas, or they're the only ones that, by constitution, are able to work within their own homeland borders as well. That's why they're able to help with disaster response, floods, you know, that type of thing. Uh Now, because of that, the National Guard was also given a mission uh, recently by the government to create um, 20, I believe it's going to be 26, what they call WMD, CST, Weapons of Mass Destruction, slash Civil Support Teams. Now, right now there is a pilot program of 10 teams, they're calling them Tiger Teams, um, that are being created in the in what they consider to be the 10 most likely targets first. Each one of these teams will consist of 22 people, full-time Active Guard Reserve, AGR, full-time people, 22, uh, with some doctors, some PAs, some nurses, some chemical specialists, and then a lot of guys that are just very brave fellows and women, mind you, that um, will put on the uniform and put on the chemical suit and go into an environment and figure out exactly what happened, what it is, how to clean it up, etc. cetera. So um, what they're, because they perceive the threat to be so real, they've decided that they're going to create 26 teams. That's one team for every other state. California will get two, one in the north and one in the south of 22 people full-time, and they're going to spend the money to train all of these people for up to 18 to 24 months of intensive training just to be able to prepare, to be prepared to deal with these exigencies. Now, when Uncle makes an assessment and he's willing to put his money where his mouth is in such a way, I think that that's sufficient evidence for even the most, um, I'd say, doubting Thomas to, Uh to sit up and take note and say, okay, something's going on, maybe I ought to pay attention. And so... The point is that there are certainly excellent things that the, the, the firemen and the EMS systems can do. There are certainly excellent things that the military side can do. Um, what, they are, what they're trying to do now is work together and figure out how they can integrate their, their skill sets to, to handle a situation like this. And I think a lot of people don't really appreciate the magnitude of something like this. It's not, this isn't just a fire or an earthquake or a flood or something that you can kind of see or come on. This is going to be if it occurs, will be a major event. It will have a rapid, sudden, shocking onset, and the results will be devastating. And they will be long-term far-reaching. And I, I think a lot of people need to fully appreciate what that means. That's why my point is, for every, all the listeners out there, okay, you know, the Y2K... <laughs> thing has come and gone mm-hmm. yeah but bear in mind it does not hurt to simply always be prepared always be ready you know to have a little aid bag to have a little food and water on hand you never know when your neighbor might get burned out of his house and you just need extra food and water to give to him and help him out or when something much more serious might happen so i tell you know everyone that i speak to about this topic please always stay prepared it's good good for you it's good for your peace of mind it's good for your family and the more prepared each and every household is out there the more everyone can contribute if there were to become some major environmental disaster that should befall any city and then we can pull together like americans should as a community so this is my big thing that i'd like to push for everyone do the research find out what's going on make your assessment and just be ready yeah, that you know that ties into the name of my show, AG, which is Preparedness Now, and I've been encouraged to change my name since uh, Y2K didn't happen and that kind of thing. By the way, I told people Y2K wasn't going to happen. Very astute of you. But I am a very preparedness type of person. I was born and raised on a farm. I've done bulk foods and stuff all my life. Mm-hmm. And my motto is to be prepared in season and out of season for any situation. To me, it's really a countermeasure. And I I know that you're a medical expert, and I'm hoping to do some medical shows with you in the future. But what are some of the medical countermeasures that people could do for this situation? What would they need to have in their home? Well, um, what I tell everyone is the first thing that you can do is, is get yourself familiar with all the basics. 
I'm a good old-fashioned, stick-to-the-basics kind of guy. You know, everyone should uh, go to their local YMCA or go to some local school program and get basic first aid, first responder, CPR-type training. You never know when you're going to need it. You know, you might have an accident. Your, your children might get hurt out in the front yard playing. You might be driving down the road and see a car accident and want to render some help. Yeah. Um, so everyone should try to get some level of basic first aid training. And then, you know, obviously, if they're more interested, pursue it further. Uh, it doesn't hurt everyone to keep a first aid kit in their home as well as in their car when they're traveling. And uh, I would say that suffices for most people. And obviously, if you have a greater interest, you can pursue it to your heart's desire up to the highest level. Um, however, the, the big things as far as NBC goes, um, as you mentioned, it, it's not something that you can take lightly or just sit down for an hour and, and, and get a class and then you're fully briefed and Yeah, it took me about, about it. four classes, and uh, this is from my own nephew, you know. It took me about four times before I knew that I could just pop that gas mask on and clear it and do everything needs to be. And I also understand the filters. You know, people think they buy these filters, and if they rattle, they're no good. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand what you're buying. Boy, oh yeah, and and that yeah that's uh, it's involved. certainly at the user level of okay your mask and your protective gear. Um, then you've got the alarm systems, the decontamination systems, and then you have the uh, knowing how to read what type of agent you're up against, so you can know what courses of actions to take. And that I've taken a combat chemical casualty care course, and first thing they do is lay on your desk a book that's about literally a thousand pages. Thick, <laughs> and each page contains this technical information about one different agent that you might encounter. Oh, wow, that's involved. Hey, we've got to take a break. Mm -hmm. My guest is A.G. Hawk. Stick around. We're having a great conversation. And we'll, we're going to tell you about his book and how you can get it, too. <laughs> 